Chapter 1 A Hazara Village Such a crowd of girls and every one of them hideous. But they were quite unconscious of that and probably there was not one among them who considered herself anything below the average in the scale of beauty. Nor were they according to the accepted standards of their tribe, for they were Hazaras broad squat little persons with faces like full moons and heads like rugged bullets all bumps and nodules covered with straight coarse lank black hair which only half conceal the curious outline of the skull moreover they had tiny sunken eyes high cheekbones flat noses sallow complexions feet and hands like their persons short broad and powerful and when they walked it was with a heavy, plodding gait. Their dress, too, seemed specially adapted to emphasize these peculiarities. It was made of print, wadded throughout and consisted of a body and full skirt, made separately, but sewn together at the waist, where there was a thick piping to give substance enough to support the heavy skirt. There was no attempt at shaping or fitting. The sleeves even were quite straight, narrowing gradually from the shoulder to the wrist. Only the gathers of the thick wadded skirt made the waist look narrower than the hips and gave to these curious little people a certain grotesque, picturesque appearance. Their surroundings were picturesque too, a perfectly pure blue sky, a sky we know nothing of in England clearer, if possible, even than a Monte Carlo sky, and the whole atmosphere was dear to. Everywhere around stretched undulating hills and dales, all beautifully green with spring grass, dotted over with innumerable cows and sheep and goats and a few camels, while away far in the distance, against that wonderful clear blue sky, rose the white tops of the higher mountains, which were still covered with snow for it was spring and the snows had not melted yet. Close behind the girls and forming their immediate background rose a mud tower, which might have been called two-storied, but that the place where the lower room ought to have been was filled up by a solid mass of mud, baked hard by the sun of many summers. So as a matter of fact, it contained just one room, capable of holding about a dozen persons closely packed together. This room and the flat roof above it being reached by a steep winding staircase, no two steps of which were the same height. Some were so high that only a very active person could have climbed up them, others so low as hardly to be worth calling steps at all, so that a stranger unaccustomed to these irregularities was apt to get a shock when having raised his foot almost up to the knee of the other leg preparatory to making a huge step upwards he suddenly found it drop almost to the level of the one on the lower step. Of these, slight of these slight inconveniences, however, the village inhabitants were blissfully unconscious. This was the tower, a place of the greatest importance in the village. At night it was occupied by some dozen men, all fully armed, who took it in turns to sleep on the roof so as to be able themselves protected by a rampart about ten inches high, to keep watch on the country road about and, if necessary, sound the drum to summon all the male villagers to protect the flocks and herds and young spring crop from Turkoman tribes, who were continually making raids on them, laying waste their land, carrying off their cattle and their sheep, and also sometimes their girls and young boys as slaves. For Hazaras are naturally hard-working and industrious, and being also strong and active, they make excellent servants and even beasts of burden, and in the towns at any rate are cheaper to feed than donkeys, go faster carrying almost as much, and do not need a man to drive them. Poor, heavy, dull Hazara. 
but he is patient and industrious and not really devoid of intelligence in spite of the subjection in which he is held. So his day may yet come, and then let his master beware, for he is fierce, revengeful, and cruel. If he ever does strike, he will strike hard. To the left of the tower and joined onto it was a long, low building, also made of mud. This was evidently a cattle shed or stable, or something of that sort, for it was open in front and at the time at which we were being introduced to it, about nine o'clock in the morning, was occupied chiefly by cocks and hens and a few pigeons puffed out and prancing round in semicircles, paying devoted court to apparently indifferent maids who stalked contemptuously on, picking up here grain there a scrap of bread, albeit casting a hurried occasional glance back, just to see that their admirers were keeping up unflagging attentions. In front lay a great sheep dog, rough, unkempt, apparently asleep, but watchful. At right angles to this shed and opposite the tower, stretched a long low building or row of buildings projecting nowhere more than 20 or 30 feet from the hill which protected them from the chill north winds one storied buildings for the most part but one at last that adjoining the shed had a sort of upper story closed on three sides by a dead wall but open on the third except where it was partially screened in by a number of tall bulrushes Beyond this and down the hill there were other similar buildings, many of them in fact, but the mud was less smoothly laid and the ground in front of them less carefully swept, and they projected less beyond the protecting hill, so little in fact that it was easy enough to see that their outer wall was a mere frontage to the true dwelling, which was literally hollowed out of the hillside and extended often two, sometimes three rooms deep into this very center. Other dwellings had no wall in front at all, but were mere caves, more like the habitations of wild beasts than of men. Such then in brief was a Hazara village, consisting of some two hundred houses or so, and the dwelling with the little scrap of what one may call second story was the residence of the chief, or Mir, of one of the most important subdivisions of the Hazara tribe. Next to this structure, and separated from it indeed by a few yards, was another, similar in all particulars, except that it could boast of no upper chamber. This was the residence of the chief's cousin, his brother he called him, though he was his uncle's, not his father's son who acted as his assistant and advisor, his vizier, in fact, a man of rather unusual qualities in that country, for he had ideas, ambitions, plans. Moreover, he had much more influence with his tribe than had the nominal chiefs, and was everywhere looked up to and respected. They were chattering, of course, those girls. How could it be otherwise in any nation? when twenty young female things were sitting together in a group. But these girls had something special to talk about. Evidently, something more than usually interesting was going on. And every now and then, one would pout and look dissatisfied, perhaps even a little sad. But another would laugh and look coy and happy and knock over the companion squatting beside her, who had evidently been chaffing her. Nothing rude or rough in the bush that had sent her neighbors sprawling, only play which was in no way resented. But there was a good deal of noise, and certainly no one was thinking of work, when another young woman stepped from the vizier's dwelling and joined them. Her dress was exactly similar to theirs, her hair black, her mood distinctly powerful, but there the resemblance ceased, for she was tall, full head and shoulders taller than any other girl present. Moreover, she had fair, smooth skin and a bright complexion, large, intelligent eyes, a nose instead of a knob in the center of her face, a well-shaped head placed in a well-shaped neck, long, well-shaped feet and hands, and a step as elastic as a deer's, carriage erect and dignified. 
This was Bull Vega, the pride and beauty of her tribe, her father's hope and joy, the object of many an ill-natured remark from the less well-favored of her sex. Alas, that it should be so. What are you all doing here making such a noise? She asked. Ah, Dilbahar, you are here too. She broke off, suddenly frowning. Go to your work, bad girl. Are the pots and pans all clean, the meat washed, the rice ready that you sit idling here? The girl thus addressed slunk quietly away. But who have you here? She went on spying among the group the cause of all the laughter, all the chatter and excitement. Mariam! Now, Mariam, what did I tell you? A wizened, cunning-eyed old woman in the center of the group looked up coaxingly. You told me what no young girl, least of all you, my lovely child, could possibly mean, she said. I never say what I do not mean, the girl replied firmly. I told you to go and not come back. We don't want you here. Making our girls dissatisfied, putting foolish notions in their heads, making them neglect their work. We don't believe your promises, and we are not afraid of bad omens. Oh, aren't we? whispered one girl, squatting at her feet to her neighbor. It is all very well for Gulbegum. She was born under a lucky star. But it is different for us, who have to work now as girls and will probably have to work harder still as wives. Come, just this once, give me an old pair of long leather boots or a little salt and I'll tell you your fortune. And such a fortune too, my fair princess, such a fortune. And the old hand rubbed her hands and chuckled to herself. I have others to whom to give my old boots. Gulbegum said, others who work and who deserve them. You only roam through the country telling lies, deceiving young girls. Get up, be gone. A scowl gathered on the old fortune teller's face. She bent her head down till it rested on her knee, then looked up sideways at the girl towering above her. What lies have I told? she asked. Did Sarah's uncle lose her cattle? Did Nekbach's own father sell her into slavery for a gun? Did Nokra wed above her highest expectations? Did Dilbahar become a disgrace to her tribe? And is she not now glad to hide her face in a stranger's house, a servant, a menial, where she would formerly have waited on as a guest? Answer me that. Gulbegum had turned a little white. What the old woman said was true enough, and the girl, though cast in a different mold, was not altogether above the superstitions of her race. Ignoring the first part of the old woman's speech, which was perhaps unanswerable, she caught hold of the letter. Dilbahar was a good girl till you put your curse on her, she said. She never went astray till then, besides service is no disgrace. It is better to be good and serve than to have so much time on one's hand that one's thoughts stray off to evil. And what about your time? The old hag asked, chuckling again. Where do your thoughts soar, my beauty? To Bamiyan, perhaps, or to some yet higher sphere, maybe? A hot, angry flush mounted on the young girl's cheek. She stretched out her hand menacingly. Be gone, old witch, she said. Be gone. Half the misfortunes of the tribe come from your idle prattings. Be gone, and don't dare show your face here again. For if you do, I'll set the dogs on you. The old woman rose slowly and with evident difficulty. She was stiff, and her back was bent with age and the weights she had perhaps had to carry in her youth. Suddenly she darted forward and seized Gulbegum's still outstretched arm, and casting her glance hurriedly at the hand that had thus come within her reach. She examined it eagerly, then flung it from her with a mocking, derisive laugh. Be gone, old witch, be gone, she echoed, jeering. 
Yes, I'll be gone. I will be. Come, old Maryam, come someday. Come and tell me of something to live for, something of peace and love and rest, somewhere, anywhere. But Maryam will not come. The vizier's daughter, the chief's niece, has cast old Maryam out. Is it likely that she will care to visit the rejected, the prisoner, the slave? Old Maryam has nothing good for you, fine, handsome, haughty maid. Your pride must have a fall. You will have dust to leak and tears to dry. Your day will soon be over, and you will come to envy old Maryam, who wanders free among the Hazara hills. Then picking up a bundle fastened in the red handkerchief, she planted her stick firmly on the ground and slowly and steadily walked down the hill. But Gulbegum stood still where she had left her. The flush had died out of her cheeks, and she had turned deadly pale. She made two or three steps forward, then suddenly stopped and put her hand up to her heart. She felt a chill all through her. Her fingers even were white. The group of chattering girls had melted away, and she stood there alone, cold and shivering, with a curse upon her 